This is a business that it's very important to remember. You will get hired to do what you show you can do. I believe you originally set out to be a director. I wouldn't say I set out to be a director. You know, when I was first interested in making films, um, uh, you know, I spent many years studying fine art. Fine art was my passion, and it still is my passion because to me, this is fine art in a different medium. Um, but when I originally transitioned into thinking I might want to do it, I, as, as a visual artist who is the principal author, I thought, well, I would want to be the auteur, hence the director, and that made sense to me. And so all through college, that was sort of what I was thinking. And then I got out and my first feature film that I worked on, um, I got on set and, you know, I was hustling. I did all kinds of things over the period of time. This is the job I was telling you about where I was volunteering and I was working with professionals. And uh, the first thing they threw at me because, you know, I was a musician. I did a lot of recording, so I knew sound. So they had me be the boom operator. Um, and then the sound guy had days he couldn't show up because, again, we're all volunteering. And, and that's another thing about volunteering. Because of the attrition, you step up pretty quickly. So he trained me how to record sound, so I'm recording sound. And, you know, I learned grip work and, um, oh, the first AC can't show up. Brad, you want to pull focus? You know, can you run a camera? I mean, I went from being the little guy to, you know, being the guy that, you know, a couple of times it was me and the director and a wind-up Bolex and we were the crew. So, you know, that was, that was kind of the thing. But when I was on that job and I was watching that director, who's a friend to this day, and I you know, really respect this guy, but everybody was hitting on him. Everybody on set wanted a piece of him, you know. Um, you know, understandably, uh, you know, the, the actors wanted his time and the uh, wardrobe people and the producer and the location people. And it's just like, you know, okay. And then over here is the DP. Now this person has the magic box and they get to look through the magic box and make the pretty pictures. They get the lights, the toys, and I'm thinking, now that, that looks like fun. And um, the funny thing to me is, is that was, that, was the, that was the instinct in that moment. Years later, looking at it retroactively, you know, I have a lot of interest in science, just a huge science geek. I love history and I love music and, of course, visual art. And I was reflecting and I realized that all of those disciplines converge in cinematography. You know, you've got the art, obviously. You've got the science in terms of the technology, the physics, um, you know, uh, optics, things like that. You've got history because you understand, you know, the way that, that a film was shot in the 20s versus the 40s. You understand, um, you know, the history of cameras and film grain and digital um, because it all plays in and informs your creative choices. You know, if I want something with a little bit of a retro look, I have to understand that history. Plus, the industry's got a fascinating history. Um, and then as ter in terms of music, I've done a lot of camera operating, and I've come to find that there are rhythms. Even if, you're, even if you aren't aware of it, nobody's tapping out a drum, but in a scene, in my head, I've got a metronome, and I'm like, this person, that person, this person speaks, they grab the glass, and I find there's a rhythm. And to reinforce this, I'll tell you an interesting story about how I cut my montages. Most people find a piece of music, cut to the beats of the music. I never do that. To me, it feels artificial. It feels forced. I will cut to the rhythms of the visuals, and then I will find music that fits those. And the thing that is just profound to me time and again is you find the right song, and it just drops into place, and all those beats hit. Um, and sometimes you maybe there's a little nip or tuck here, you know. Sometimes I might cut the music and, and fiddle with it a little bit. But, and sometimes the, the rhythm changes, you know, we're all splicing a different piece of music. But literally, all the feature montages on my website were done that way. None of them were cut to music. So, so just the rhythm of it. And so all of those things converging, it just made me realize, um, I'm, not a, I'm not a spiritual person, but, but things like that are kind of profound. It's at least magical, you know, when the universe conspires or whatever it is. You know, even though I don't embrace anything, I don't exclude anything. Maybe there is something really cool out there that put me here. Um, but uh, 
yeah, that was that was kind of the thing is that, uh, you know, I, I made that decision. I had that impulse on that first set. And then looking back, I was just overwhelmed by by all the affirmation of why that had been the right decision. When did you realize that being a filmmaker in Houston, Texas wasn't the place for you at that time? And then what happened when you moved here to Los Angeles? It's a good question. So so obviously I started my career in the film industry in Houston and I had you know people I worked with who are mentors and friends and I still do. I've, I've been back, I've worked there again. Um, I'm a big supporter of Houston and of Texas. Um, I'm an advocate of, of the filmmaking community there and I want to see it do well. Um, I, I have a lot of mentees there to this day, um, and I support the community. I just actually was invited to uh, become a board member for Southwest Alternative Media Project in Houston, which is a film advocacy and education group that's been around since the 70s. So I'm really honored, and I feel that I'm still a part of that community. Um, uh, but uh, what I did realize at the time was, you know, because I, I knew I wanted to be a cinematographer. There wasn't any question. I've always known what I wanted to be. Even when I was a little kid, I knew I wanted to be a garbage man. Now, I didn't stay wanting to be a garbage man. Then I wanted to be an astronaut. But I've never been one of those people who didn't know. So, I, I you know, even though that has swapped out. And and so I knew at that time, and I and I thought about it, and there were some really good cinematographers in, in town, and, and still are, and I thought, you know, in order for me to get a shot, you know, these guys are going to have to retire or there's going to have to be more work. And it really became evident to me that it was a little bit of a closed ecosystem. It was a small market. Um, and I thought, you know, I realized what a sacrifice it was going to be. I realized in terms of my free time, in terms of, you know, the volunteering I would have to do to, you know, earn my stripes and build my network and learn my skills. Um, just in terms of uh, being a freelancer and not having regular work, um, the uncertainty, you know, all of those things. And I realized, okay, I'm taking a big risk. And that sort of percolated in my brain. And the funny thing is I never made a calculated decision to leave. One day I, I walked home, or I didn't walk home, I drove home, and I walked into the house because, yeah, I was living with my parents at 25 because... Why not? You know, as a filmmaker, they were nice people. I loved them and I was happy to be there. Um, and, you know, for practical reasons, I'm like, you know, I, I have no need for that expense and I'm content. So I stayed there. And I, so I walked home. I didn't walk home. I keep saying that I, I drove home and I, I was walking into the house and I, and I just I had this lark that I was just going to go provoke my parents. I was just going to tell them that I was moving to LA just to get a rise out of them. And, and I figured they would talk me out of it. And, and uh, so I, I walked in and, um, you know, there had, there had been no prelude to this. It had never been discussed before. And I walked in and I said, I've decided to move to Los Angeles. And they said, that's wonderful. We completely support you. We think that's just such a smart decision. And, and in that moment, I thought, oh, shit, I've committed myself. I have to follow through now. Um, because, again, I, you know, but the funny thing is, you know, just like I say, uh, you know, maybe sometimes the universe guides you because maybe it was just like, you know, I got pushed to where I needed to be in that moment because, again, it wasn't a conscious thing. Um, but I made plans with a camera assistant friend of mine, you know, to, to go out. And I'd already had some friends out here. Um, I had some filmmaker friends and I thought, okay, well, I'll go and I'll cast my lot with those people. You know, none of them were established. They were all, you know, wanting to be filmmakers. And I had this one friend who said, well, I could come crash on her floor. Um, and so, you know, my friend and I made plans and we would leave in a month. And um, started thinking about it and like, why are we waiting a month? And I was like, let's just go. So. Two weeks in, we left. So we got there and, um, you know, living, living like uh, thieves on the, on the floor. And um, this could be a long story, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to fast forward. Does so it involve it was, the whiskey go-go? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Why do I feel like some of that's coming yeah. in? No? Okay. Well, we were, I, I was in Venice. It was beautiful. My, uh -huh. my friend lived in a townhouse in Venice. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, but anyway, I got there and I had a lot of delusions. I really did. I thought, you know, um, um, oh, and the, the other reason that, that it made sense to me at the time was that, you know, 
instead of making all these sacrifices for this limited market, if I'm going to pay this price, I'm going to go where the sky's the limit. You know, that was the logic that that reinforced that decision. Um, so I get out here and I just I made so many bad assumptions about how I was going to be welcomed with open arms and get business and get work. And, you know, probably 30,000 other people had that same idea, you know, and so I spent I spent some years kind of aimlessly and, uh, you know, to make a living, I was doing temp work in offices. Um, I was doing the freebies at the time. They had this publication called Drama Log, which is kind of like, you know, the uh, what Craigslist is today. A lot of it was student films, but I'm like, you know, I'm building a reel. I still I had a few things I'd shot in Houston, but I didn't have much of a reel. So, you know, I just needed more footage. And, you know, even if I'm working for free, somebody else is paying for the film and the locations and the camera. Um, so I did that for a while um, and it was really dodgy. And, and, and at one point I had this epiphany and I thought, you know, all the people I know are at the same level I am. You know, we, we kind of got into this and said, you know, all for one and one for all, we're all going to be filmmakers. The problem with that is I realized that if I want to make a living at this, I have to work with people who do it for a living, you know? And that was a very transformational realization for me. And when I did that, I that's when I started moving forward. And I started, you know, applying to companies like Concord, New Horizons, one of my really good buddies out here um, worked for them. And uh, he was in the, the marketing department, but, you know, he gave me names and, and pointed me in the right direction. And, and that's just kind of how it got started. And, you know, from there, it took a couple of years. And then I shot some movies for those guys. Um, you know, did some more indies. Um, a young fellow who I mentored in Houston um, ended up blowing up as a huge music video director. And, you know, through a, a, a set of circumstances, we ended up working together and that jumped me up some levels. Um, and then when music videos kind of subsided, I transitioned over, you know, the big budgets kind of went away. I transitioned over to commercials and, um, and then those kind of uh, evaporated and, and now I'm doing narrative again. So probably cut big chunks of that out. <laughs> no, no, I, I love I love the story. So that that's interesting. So you're here in LA and you're you're enjoying time with friends, but you looked around and said, what is going to set me apart from these people? And it was that realization knowing that you were working with other people that this was paying their mortgage. This was yeah. putting their kids in school and knowing that they were going to take it very seriously. I don't know, I'm I'm paraphrasing, but Well, I don't know. I think that the whole set yourself apart realization came a bit later. All I realized was that I was working with wannabes. I was a wannabe. My peers were wannabes, you know, but wannabes, if you, if it's, it's like, it's like entropy, you know, you're in a vacuum and, and nobody in there has the capacity to advance you unless you get lucky. It's like the lottery, you know, do you, you know, win a festival award? And even then, what does that matter? You know, so, um, this is a business that it's very important to remember. You will get hired to do what you show you can do. So if all you do is freebie low budget stuff, that's what you're gonna get brought on for. If all you do is volunteer stuff, you know, that may be what you get stuck in. If all you do is commercials, it's gonna be hard to get a feature film. And even if you do commercials like me, and you got a broad variety of stuff, if somebody wants a car commercial, well, they want the car person. They want the one with, you know, 10, 10 car spots or, you know, the beauty person. I can do all of those things, you know, and I have, and I can show them, but I don't have the preponderance. And, and so that was the thing that, that, you know, just going back to my early, my first experience with that phenomenon was that I was working with, with wannabes. People I liked, people who were talented, but nobody who was in a position to jump me up to a salaried position. And I had to break outside of that paradigm, you know, just end the entropy, go to a, a completely different model. And that model was to find the people who were getting paid to do the work and work with them. And that was really probably one of my very first significant realizations of, of, you know, learning the dynamics in this industry. And we basically are all wannabes when we start out at something. So I'm still really a wannabe. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's still things I want to do. I, I don't say that that term maliciously at all. It's just, you know, we were powerless. We had no connections and nobody was giving us money. So, you know, it's not a judgment. It's just that was the fact.